Something that, that, that happened this weekend, uh, this past week, we also, a lot of us engaged in our Seek Week prayer and fasting, and we had three nights of prayer here in, this, uh, in the main sanctuary, as well as at our sites. And one of the things that really was uh, awesome to me about our Seek Week, every one of the nights that we had prayer here, uh, was we, we called all of the youth up on stage, anyone from college age down, uh, we caught them up on stage, and every night the stage was packed with young people uh, that came out to pray on a weeknight. I don't know about you, but that's amazing right there. Uh, and they were engaging in prayer, praying for uh, the world and their generation, their friends and their family. And so we got to pray for all of our young people and just believe in God that, that a revival is going to break out in our communities and in the world through this next generation. Amen. So I want to encourage you to continue to pray for our young people. We really believe that uh, they are not just the leaders of the future, but they are the leaders of today. And now that I'm getting older, I realize, man, they're going to be leading the world that I retire in. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we got to raise them up right. Amen. And so continue to pray with us. And if you, if you feel God put on your heart to want to serve and, and help make a difference, come and talk to our team. We'd love to have uncles and aunties and grandmas and grandpas involved in making disciples of the next generation. It's going to take all of us, not just our, our young, young leaders. It's going to take a whole family to really make a difference in the next generation. So continue to pray for our young people. Well, anyway, we are continuing our series, Amazing Grace. And uh, we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks that how God's grace saves us not because of our good works, but by his grace. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved by the amazing grace of God. How many of you think that's pretty awesome? We need to be reminded of that regularly because we live in a society that tells us you are what you do. You are what you can produce. And, and, and we identify ourselves with our, our competencies, our skills, our successes. And, and sometimes we superimpose that onto God saying that I have to earn God's approval. I have to earn God's pleasure or he's not gonna want anything to do with me. And before we get into the rest of this message, I think it's important that we understand that, that, that God's grace comes to us not because of anything that we've done, but simply because of who he is, amen? His grace comes to us to save us, not because we've earned it or we deserve it, because we can never do enough to earn and deserve God's grace. He gives it freely because that's who he is. He's a good and a loving God. And the only thing that we do is we receive it like a gift and we say thank you for the grace of God in our lives. If you're here this morning and you're new, God's grace is available for you. He wants to pour his love out into your life. All you have to do is receive it. If you're here and you've been a Christian for 100 years, never forget that you are what you are. We are what we are because of God's amazing grace. And that should create gratitude in all of our hearts every single day. Can I hear an amen to that? A lot of people will ask, well, if I'm saved by grace through faith, not because of anything that I do, why does it matter how I live then? Anyone ever thought about that question? If I'm saved by grace, not because of anything I do, does it matter how I live? And then you come to church and you start reading the Bible, and it sure seems to talk a lot about how we live and why that's important. How do those two things connect together? I hope to, to bring some clarity this morning, but also talk about the reality that God's grace wants to transform our lives. He, he loves us just the way that we are, but he loves us too much to leave us just the way that we are. He wants to change us and transform us, and that's this process of transformation. We pick it up here in Titus chapter 2. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That's amazing. That's amazing grace. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present, this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The grace of God comes to save us and to transform us. And the title of our message this morning is Transforming Grace. Transforming Grace. In order to understand how grace transforms us, we need to understand a little bit clearly, uh, more clearly, what our spiritual condition really is. Because a lot of times we think that, that, that the reason why I'm a sinner is because of my bad behavior, right? That I am what I do. So I do bad things, therefore I'm a sinner. The reality is our sin problem goes deeper than just our behavior. We don't sin because we're sinners. I mean, we don't, we're not sinners because we sin. The reality is we, we sin because we're sinners, it's a fundamental difference. We already are sinners by nature, and that's why we do things that are bad. We behave in ways that are inconsistent with God's word. The, 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 the fundamental problem of our lives is not a behavior problem. It's actually a relationship problem. 
The first sin that ever occurred in the garden in, in the book of Genesis, it wasn't the eating of the fruit that why sin entered the world. It was this desire to live independently of God. This desire to say, God, I don't want anything to do with you. I want to live my life the way that I want to live it. I don't want relationship with you, God. And out of that severing of a relationship, we now live in a way that is in distant relationship to God. I was, I was thinking about this, you know, when I, was, when I was a kid, I had a neighbor who used to go to church, and so we'd play on the weekend, and he used to invite me to come to church. But the way that he invited me wasn't the best way to invite a six-year-old kid. He said, hey, do you want to go to Sunday school? <laughs> and I remember thinking, no, no, I go to school Monday to Friday. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is go to school on Sunday, because I imagine, you know, sitting at a desk, and, you know, and I, I don't want to do that on Sunday. Sunday's play, you know, I want to watch cartoons and wake up late and all this kind of stuff. And so I don't want to go to Sunday school. But I remember as a young child thinking also that I don't want to go to church and hear somebody tell me how I have to live, right? I don't want to hear more about rules. I got enough rules, right? I don't want to just hear about the rules and the things that I need to do uh, in life. I, I want to live the way that I want to live. And now that I'm older and I reflect back on that, it's kind of interesting that a, that a six-year-old was thinking, you know, I want to live the way that I want to live. I don't want to follow anyone's rules, let alone God's rules. But that right there is the heart of what sin actually is. This desire to live the way that I want to live. Some of you here this morning may be thinking, I want to live the way that I want to live. I don't like your rules, Pastor. I'm trying to help you understand that that's not the core of what Christianity is. But, but sometimes we think that if, if, and here's the problem, if we think that our sin problem is a behavior problem, then I can fix my sin problem with good behavior, right? If my problem is a behavior problem, then if I just do good things instead of bad things, then God must be pleased with me. And that's why you hear people say stuff like, well, I'm a basically a good person. I do a lot of good deeds, you know, so the man upstairs, he's probably decently happy with me, right? And we think that when we go to heaven, we're going to stand before God. He's going to pull up a list of all of our bad deeds and pull up a list of all of our good deeds. And if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, then he's going to be okay with us, right? That's not a biblical concept. The reality is God's going to, when we stand before him in heaven, he's going to ask us one simple question. Do you have a relationship with me? One simple question. It's kind of like this. It's like if someone were to knock on your door in the middle of the night, you go to the door, you know, maybe with a shotgun or something, you go to the door, and you're not going to go show me a list of all your good deeds versus all of your bad deeds, and if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then I'll let you come into my house at three in the morning, right? It doesn't work that way. You're going to look out the window or your peephole or whatever, and you're going to go, do I know you? And if I know you, you can come into my house. Our problem is not a behavior problem. It's a relationship problem. And all of us in our heart, we've at different points in time said, God, I don't want a relationship with you. And out of that rejection of relationship comes our behavior, the way that we live our lives. This is so important to understand. Because if the problem is not a behavior problem but a relationship problem, then the solution isn't good behavior. It's reconciled relationship with God. Are you following me? And God, by his grace, came down. He sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life in perfect relationship with God to die a sacrificial death on the cross so that we can, through him, enter into right relationship with God. Our problem is a relationship problem, and the solution is relationship with God. This is so important that we understand this. Therefore, everything in our lives now, if you're a Christ follower, is about growing in deeper and deeper relationship with God. That's where transformation comes from. It comes as we grow closer and closer in relationship with God. Let's take a look back at our verse in Titus chapter 2. This grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And this salvation now teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. First point here in your notes says this, God's grace empowers our transformation. His grace empowers our transformation. In order to live the lives that God's called us to live, we need to be transformed. Isn't that true? But even this transformation isn't just by our own willpower alone to behave better and to do better. Transformation comes through relationship with God. Because all of us in our willpower, we can do good for a little while, but then typically we revert back to what our flesh wants, what's easiest for us. I thought it was kind of funny, um, you know, usually around this time of the year when you go to the gym, it's really packed, yeah? Like everyone's, you know, started their New Year's resolutions and it's usually super packed until around Valentine's Day and then everyone's like, nah, it's too hard, right? And they quit. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting to me, I was talking with one of my friends that, wow, the gym's been really empty lately. 
And so I, I, you know, I've been noticing it you know, time after time. And so I talked to one of the workers. I said, has it been uncharacteristically slow this year? He said, yeah, it's been really slow. In fact, we've had to lay off some guys because like, no one's coming to the gym. And I thought, that's good for me, you know, because I hate when it's super crowded. But, but he, then he said this interesting line. He said, it's like everyone just gave up. Like everyone just gave up. You know, maybe they've tried New Year's resolutions in the past. Never worked, so nah, you know. You know, like pay $50 a month, you know, for other people to use the gym for me, you know. Um, but he said, it's like everyone gave up. And I thought, that's an interesting picture of what happens when we try to transform ourselves by ourselves. At some point, you get discouraged. Isn't that true? At some point, you just want to give up. Because I tried that before. I tried to be a good boy or a good girl. I tried to change my thoughts and change my behavior on my own. At some point, you're going to get discouraged and want to give up. Because transformation is not something that we can do ourselves. It's a work of the Holy Spirit that comes only through deeper and deeper relationship with God. But God's grace is what empowers our transformation. Notice it says, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. It doesn't say, you say no. It says, the grace of God teaches us, empowers us, gives us the strength to say no. Saying no to ungodliness and worldly passions is not something that human beings can do on their own. We all revert back to our flesh every single time. That's why every single movie we watch starts with some kind of an antagonist, right? Doing some evil in the world. And it's like, why is every movie like that? Because human nature is like that. Our natural selves will revert back to sin. We can't do it on our own. We need the grace of God to teach us and empower us to experience this transformation. And many of us here have thought, I need to be transformed before God will love me. That's not true. In fact, you need God's help to experience transformation. I have a friend who tells me, I'll come to church after I get all my ducks in a row and I clean up my life. And I remember I, I told him one time, I said, then you're never coming to church, buddy. Because you're never going to get all your ducks in a row. You're never going to get your life perfectly cleaned up to the point where you think God will accept you. The reality is you need God's help to experience transformation. And that's the reality for all of our lives. It's the grace of God that teaches us to say no. He empowers our transformation. It's the grace of God that empowers us to live self-controlled lives. It doesn't, notice it doesn't say you be self-controlled. It says, no, no, no. The grace of God is what's going to help you to live a self-controlled life. To live upright and godly lives in this present age, you need his help to do that. You can't do that on your own. To represent Christ on the earth, you can't do that on your own. To be eager to do what is good, again, that is not of yourself. It is of the grace of God. So how do we access this grace to experience transformation? As I said in the beginning, it's a relationship. Look at what it says here. Um, well, it's, and, and we need this because of the life God's called us to live. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is why we need the grace of God, to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So how do we experience this? A good illustration of this is a guy by the name of John Newton. The song Amazing Grace, he wrote the song Amazing Grace back in 1772, um, which we titled this, this series after. And Amazing Grace is probably the most beloved hymn of all time. Um, soaring, uh, it, it's, it's been performed, they estimated over 10 million times a year in different venues. It's appeared in over a thousand albums in different shapes and forms. And John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace after he experienced God's amazing grace. And what we need to know about John Newton is before this, he was actually a slave trader. He captained ships that ran slaves, human slaves from Africa, all around Europe. John Newton was that guy. He profited off of human slavery. He, not be, beyond that, uh, he lived a very licentious lifestyle. He was known to be a womanizer and a drunk. One day, uh, during a voyage, uh, transporting slaves likely in 1748. His ship was caught in a horrendous storm off the coast of Ireland and almost sank. Uh, Newton cried out to God. He knew enough about God to cry out to God. He cried out to God and miraculously, the ship's hull that had a huge hole in it was filled when one of the cargo, some of the cargo shifted to block the incoming water. The ship then drifted and, and was able to be saved on land and he recognized that it was God's miraculous provision that saved him. But he said something very interesting. He said he did not radically change after this happened. I mean, I don't know about you. If my ship was sinking, I cried out to God and cargo filled the hole. I might, you know, 
ah, right? Um, but he admits that, and this is his exact quote, he said, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word until a considerable time afterwards. What's interesting is, even after that am amazing deliverance, he actually went on to continue uh, in the slave trade for six more years. But his, he began studying and reading the Bible. He said, man, there's got to be something to this God thing. So he began studying the Bible. He began learning. But he continued in his lifestyle for another six years until eventually the word of God gripped his heart. And then he realized, I need to get out of this. This is wicked. This is evil. And he left the, the slave trade altogether. He later wrote in one of his journals, it is certain that I am not what I ought to be, but blessed be God that I am not what I once was. God has mercifully brought me up out of the deep miry clay and set my feet upon the rock of Jesus Christ. He saved my soul, and now it's my heart's desire to extol and honor his matchless, free, and sovereign, distinguishing grace. Because by the grace of God, I am what I am. It is my heart's great joy to ascribe my salvation entirely to the grace of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. He started to change. But it didn't happen right away. Six more years living in that lifestyle, but he started to change. And the word of God began to transform his heart until he left the slave trade. And then several years later, he then fought along with others to abolish the slave trade in Europe. And shortly before his death in 1807, he got to see a law passed that eventually that, that outlawed the slave trade in all of Europe. He changed, but it didn't happen right away. You would think you're dying in the ocean, God saves you, that's it, I'm done, you know? I'm gonna live for God forever. No, it, took, it was a process. And I share this to say, all of us are in a process, amen? Every single one of us are in a process. Some of us are further along in the process than others, some of us are further behind in the process, but we're all in the process. And can I encourage you this morning, don't quit the process. Trust the process, as some would say, amen? Don't, don't, don't give up. Don't quit just because you're not seeing the results that you wanted to see. Just because you're still struggling with sin and temptation and different things. Don't quit because God will never quit on you. If God won't quit on a man like John Newton who sold humans into slavery, God won't quit on you no matter how bad your past. Amen? Just keep moving forward. You know, they say that, they say, you know, in, in, in fights and martial arts and different things, they, they, they stop the fight when the guy stops fighting back. Isn't that true? Like last night, I heard, you know, Donald Cerrone got knocked out. He stopped fighting, right? And then the referee had to step in and stop the fight. Just keep fighting. Don't stop fighting because eventually, if you keep on fighting by the grace of God, you will win and you will overcome. I know a lot of people who quit the fight, who give up on God because they're not seeing the change the way that they want to see it. Can I encourage you this morning? Transformation is a process that God will do in our lives, but we cannot quit. Like John Newton don't quit. Can I hear an amen to that? So how do we experience and encounter the Holy Spirit that will empower our transformation? We encounter the Holy Spirit and access God's grace through regular spiritual practices. This is in your notes, through regular spiritual practices. Some people you'll hear, you know, we'll say, we'll call it spiritual disciplines. Uh, discipline sounds scary to me, so I like the word practices. It just sounds nicer. Um, but through regular spiritual practices. And I wanted to make this sermon very practical for us so that we can take something home with us, that we can begin to apply to access the grace of God that's available to us for transformation, okay? So number one, or first point there in your notes of spiritual practices is to read and study the word regularly. Read and study the word regularly. Jesus said in John 8, if you abide in my word, notice it says if, right? If you abide in my word, there's a condition there that we need to fulfill. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Freedom, transformation comes as we abide in God's word. What does it mean to abide? Abide is like where you live. Isn't that true? Right? You would say, I abide in my house, wherever your house is. If you, and you say that you abide there because you go there pretty regularly. Isn't that true? You wouldn't say that you abide at a hotel because I go there, you know, once every couple times a year maybe. I abide here in my home. The question is, can we say, to, say of ourselves, I abide in God's word. I live here. I come here regularly. This is where I get my life from, in the word of God. John Newton's transformation came as he abided in the word of God. The more he read it, he began to realize how wicked his lifestyle was, how evil the slave trade was. As he kept, began to read the word and study it, transformation took root in his heart. Question for us is, if we want to experience the grace of God that will lead to transformation, are we abiding in the word of God? And we need to do so with regularity. As we read it, God shows us, like in a mirror, 
what our lives ought to look like, right? How many of us looked in the mirror this morning before we left the house, right? You're all lying. I know you did. We all did. And if you didn't, you should have, you know, right? We all did, right? I know, I know many of us looked in the mirror in the reflection in the glass as we walked into the church. I right? just one last check before I go in there, right? We all do that, and we should, because mirrors show us what we look like so we can see if there's anything wrong. I, it's kind of funny. I was thinking about this this morning that I, I usually use the restroom right before I come, to, come, walk, come into the service to preach. Stop. Get that out of your mind. But, but what I, the real, one of the things I do is I'll take one last look in the mirror, right, just to make sure there's nothing, you know. And so one service, this is a true story, it was after the 11.15 service, I was out in the lobby mingling, and then after that, I went to use the restroom. I didn't go to the bathroom before. I, and, I went, and when I looked in the mirror, I saw I had a booger stuck to my beard. <laughs> true story, okay. Nobody told me. I had conversations before service and after service. I'm looking at, and I don't have much of a beard. I tried. I, it doesn't, it's just like that. It's just ugly. Anyway, but there's a little bit of scruff. And it was like stuck there. I was like, oh my God, that must have been so obvious. All the people that I saw said nothing, you know. And, and you know, now, now I know you would have said something. That was 1115. They're horrible people. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, and, and it was just stuck there. And I thought to myself, that's what happens when you don't look in the mirror. You know, I probably blew my nose or something, you know, and it just got stuck. You know, I don't know. <laughs> that's grossing you out, I, I apologize, but it's a true story, it happened. And, and I thought to myself, that's what happens when you don't look in the mirror. You might have something stuck there that you don't want stuck there. And when we look at the word of God, it shows us like a mirror, Jesus says, what we look like. And if we don't look in the word regularly and let it show us what we look like, we could be walking around with unforgiveness on our face, you know what I'm saying? Bitterness stuck to our face, pride stuck to our face, and we're walking around and everyone else sees it, Oh, that guy's grouchy, you know what I'm saying? That guy's bitter, that guy's lustful, that guy's angry, you know, whatever it is. But we don't see it because we're not looking in the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we go, whoa, I, do, I guess I do need to forgive. Whoa, I do need to be more loving. Whoa, I do need to be more kind because it shows us what we look like in the mirror. We need to look in the mirror regularly, amen? amen. That the word of God, by his grace, can show us what we look like so that we can make a choice to get it off. <laughs> right? He lovingly wants to show us. Now, we have to be careful that when we read the Bible, we don't, we don't let it condemn us, right? Because it's easy we read the Bible and go, well, I don't look like that. Well, I guess God must be really mad at me. Well, I definitely don't look like that. Oh, man, I bet, it's too hard. I, I'm just, I guess I'm just going to quit because there's no way God's happy with me. Don't let the devil lie to you. When you look in the mirror and God shows you who you are, it's a loving, gracious thing to say, and now you can deal with it. Now you can invite me to help you to experience transformation here. If you're looking in the Word, you're going, whoa, I got a lot of things on my face. The good news is the grace of God is there to help you get it off. But the question is, are we looking into the mirror? Or are we just walking around oblivious to what is on our face, metaphorically speaking? The Word is like a mirror to show us who we are, what we look like, so that we can access the grace of God for transformation. How are you doing looking in the mirror this morning? <clears throat> not literally, <laughs> metaphorically. The second thing we see here is seek God in every situation through prayer. How do we access the grace of God to experience transformation? Just by seeking God in every situation through prayer. For a lot of people, prayer is the last resort, right? After we've tried everything, oh, I guess I better pray. After we do everything in our human strength and human ingenuity and it's not working, then we pray. The reality is prayer shouldn't be our last resort. It should be our first move. It shouldn't be our last resort. It should be our first option to go to God in prayer in every situation. Look what Philippians 4 says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, not just the dire ones, not just the ones you can't figure out on your own, every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Bible wants us to pray regularly. In every situation, calling out to God, asking for his wisdom, asking for his guidance. And prayer, you know, a lot of people say, well, how do you pray? I don't know how to pray, right? It's just a conversation. Just like you would talk to someone, that, a real person, you'd talk to God in the same way. Maybe leave out some, you know, curse words, you know. Um, but, but talking to God, God, I need your help here. How am I supposed to feel about this? I'm really frustrated with my boss, with my coworker. I'm really frustrated with what's going on in my life. God, what, do you, what will you want me to do? Lord, I need your help in this situation. It's, it's calling on to him and inviting his grace into the moment. See, remember, if our sin problem is living independently of God, prayer does the exact opposite. We're coming dependently to God. 
But notice in your heart, oftentimes we don't want to pray because we, I want to figure it out myself. That's that living independently of God thing. We need to bridge that gap by coming to God in every situation in prayer. Several weeks ago, uh, Alabama quarterback Tua Tango Vailoa was named the top model of faith in college football when he earned the Bobby Bowden Award. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the thing about Tua and all of you that, you know, follow college football and know that he's a local boy and such, but, you know, when he won the national championship a couple of years ago, he was interviewed on national TV and they asked him, how do you stay so calm on this great national stage with all of this pressure going on? And Tua said very boldly on national TV, I pray. I pray in tongues. <laughs> I remember my friend texting me, like, did you hear what Tua just said? I was like, I heard it. I can't believe he said that. But he's serious. He prays on the field, off the field, in between snaps, in between plays. And I'm sure when he went down in his, his injury this past season, he was praying. He had people praying for him. And one of the things that I love about what Tua said is, no matter what happens, God always has a plan. Even though his college football career, some were saying, could be over, and he might be losing millions of dollars in the NFL draft, God always has a plan. How do you stay so confident in the midst of that type of adversity? By praying. Prayer is not just, again, something that we do when we have no other resort. It should be what we do in every situation. Amen? And I remember I used to hear people tell me, you know, I, I, you know when I was going through a difficult situation, and, you know, prayer is what gave me the strength to keep going. And I remember I used to go, I, I get it in my mind, but what's that really like? And I, and I got to experience that first time when we went through three years with my son's health where he wasn't able to sleep and just, it was scary for a long time. And I remember many, many nights, dozens upon dozens of nights up in the middle of the night just praying and praying and praying, asking for God's help. When we were sleep deprived and we were just, just fearful and scared and depressed, God, I need your help. And I can honestly say I felt the Lord strengthen me through that. To the point where my wife and I, we talk about it sometimes that I don't know how we would have gotten through those three years if it weren't for God and his grace. How did I access that grace? Did it just come automatically? No, it's through prayer. And many of us, there's a grace that's available to help you in whatever situation you're going through, but we're not accessing it. It's like you have this amazing power that's available to us, but we don't access it through prayer. Can I encourage you here this morning, whatever maybe you are walking through, big or small, God wants to empower you to get through that. It's through prayer. You access it through prayer. Can I hear an amen to that? No matter what storm, God wants to be there. The highs, the lows, but we have to access his strength and his grace through prayer. As kind of an aside, pray for our UH football team uh, that a Christian coach gets hired, amen, um, because, uh, you know, uh, we'd like to keep serving as chaplains because some great stuff happened this past season, um, but, you know, you never know with a new coach. So pray. Let's access that through prayer. And let's see what God will do together. How do we access the, the, the grace of God for transformation? The third point, practice regular transparency and openness with others. Practice regular transparency and openness with others. This is so important. A lot of us, if you've been in church for a while, you get reading the Bible and you get prayer. But we often miss the fact that being together in small group is actually a spiritual practice as well. It's a spiritual discipline, I believe, on par with the reading the word and, and, and on par with prayer. Let's look at what the Bible says, Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, in, in, in this day, when, when the author of Hebrews is writing, there were some who said, nah, we don't need to go to church. We don't need to meet together in small groups. We don't need other people. Right? That's why he said, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. But as we meet together and we're together in smaller communities, that's why we, you hear every week here at Pearlside Church, we want everyone in small groups. Because something happens when you process life with other believers. When you're able to pray for one another and be in the lives of one another. There is a grace that is available that is not available anywhere else. Look at what it says in James 5.16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's interesting that the author James writes that, that you may be healed. It doesn't say that you may be saved. Saved, we are saved through relationship with God, through, through Jesus Christ. Healing or transformation takes place as we confess our sins to one another, as we process life with one another. It's two different Greek verbs in the original language. It's two different things. Some of us, I'm going to say this Boldly, you're not experiencing transformation because you're not meeting together with other believers. It's just, it's, it's, it's not me, it's what the Bible teaches. You're neglecting to meet together. 
You're neglecting to gather together. Now, you're here on Sunday, and that's fantastic. We're glad that you're here. But something happens in a small group that cannot happen here, where you can be open and transparent with other believers, where they can encourage you and pray for you and cry with you and and laugh with you. And all those things is where the healing takes place. That can't happen here. It's too many people. We can't have small group with 700 people. That wouldn't be small, right? You need to get into a smaller community. And I know it's scary. I know it's hard. I know all of us have been burned in relationships before. I get that. But somehow we have to fight for this spiritual practice of meeting together because that's where the grace of God is to bring healing and transformation. And all of these things work together. Those of you that are in small groups, you know what that's like. Go encourage somebody. Invite someone who's not in a group to join your group that they too may experience the power of God. One of the things that I hear a lot is, well, I don't get anything out of small group. I understand that. Uh, Maybe you've said it. Maybe you're thinking it right now. I want to say this, if you don't get anything out of small group, maybe it's because you're not supposed to get something in this season. Maybe you're not supposed to get something, maybe you're supposed to give something to somebody else. Maybe the reason why you're not getting anything is because your purpose in this season isn't to get but to give to somebody else, to be a listening ear, to be an encourager, to go golfing with and spend time with and love and pray for somebody else. Maybe this season isn't about getting for you, it's about giving. There will come a time where you're going to need to get something from others. And thank God you'll have relationships that have been built over months and years where they can now give to you. But if you're here going, I don't get anything, maybe it's because you're supposed to give. Just leave that there, pray about that. But, but meeting together is as much a spiritual discipline as is prayer and reading the word. It's in the Bible. Continues on the, 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 the last spiritual practice. How do we access the grace of God for transformation? Through reaching out to those who don't yet know Jesus. This one also often goes neglected. It's put on the side as if only super Christians do that outreach stuff. But us, you know, I I don't do that, right? Not an extrovert. (laughs) But look at what Jesus says here, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This isn't spoken just to a select few. This is to all disciples for all time. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus tags that I am with you at the end to remind us that as you go and try to make a difference in the life of somebody else, I'm with you. And my personal experience has been God actually feels closer to me when I am out trying to share the gospel with somebody else. I remember one of the first, first people that I ever, you know, led to, led to faith in Christ was a friend back when I was in high school. And I remember I was praying for this person, praying for him, God, help me, give me show, show me how to reach out to this person, and all these things. And then I knew I was going to have a conversation. God, help me have this conversation. And after the conversation went well and they re- received the Lord, I, after I was overjoyed. And I remember driving home praying, God, thank you that I got to help my friend come to know you. And I felt so close to him in that moment. I realized when he says, I am with you always to the end of the age, He's serious about that. As we go, he goes with us because he's actually already there and he's waiting for us to go and be involved in what he's involved in. Some of us are missing a step in our transformation because we've said, no, 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 that's optional and that's for other people. And you know what? Sometimes we make it harder than it actually needs to be. It's actually just loving someone, praying for someone, being generous to someone and kind to someone. And and, and you're going to find that that does so much to make a difference in somebody's heart. But through reaching out to those who don't yet know Jesus, we experience the grace of God in a different measure. And I want to encourage you to be praying about somebody who's maybe in your life that's far from God. Maybe they're hurting. Maybe they're depressed and you know it. And God's put on your heart to love and serve them. As you go, you're going to find, you're going to experience the grace of God at a whole other degree. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in my own life came as I was serving other people and making a difference in someone else's life in the midst of my own pain. You're going to experience that too as you go. And ultimately, as we close here this morning, we need to be reminded that the goal of God's grace is to make us like Jesus in order to make a difference. It's to make us like Jesus in order to make a difference. Titus 2, from that verse we just read, the grace of God came to teach us to say no, right? To teach us to live godly lives, and it ends with this, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. Notice it distinguishes and clarifies what it means to be a people that are Christ's very own, eager to do what is good. Not selfish, not self-centered, not saying, oh, those people out there and we're better. It's eager to do what is good. 
to make a difference in the lives of others, just as Jesus did for us. That's what the grace of God is for, to change us to be more like him. Amen? But ultimately, we need to be reminded that all this stuff that we do, we don't do it to earn God's grace. His grace is given to us freely. Amen? That's why it's amazing. If we had to earn it, it wouldn't be as amazing. His grace is free. All of these practices just help us to access it in a deeper and deeper relational way with him. We need to be reminded over and over that we are his. And that's why we do this. That's why we, we try to draw closer. That's why we want to make a difference because we are his. This should motivate us to access his grace more and more and more. I read a story recently that I want to share with you that I think powerfully illustrates the grace of God and reminds us who this amazing God that we serve is. His grace is available not because we're good, but because he's good. Amen? And I want to read you this story. It's, it's an excerpt that uh, Timothy Paul Jones tells in his book, Proof, on, and, he, and it's about the grace of God. <clears throat> and he tells this story about taking his adopted daughter to Disney World. <clears throat> and he said this, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I, Timothy, am sure that this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption. I can't imagine what that would be like to be an adopted child and only to be um, booted out of the family. And we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home, he says. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World, and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades, but when it came time to pass through the gates of the Magic Kingdom herself, she had always been left on the outside. Once I found out about this story, I made plans to take her to Disney World. What I didn't expect was the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in, my, in our adopted daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She insulted her sister in carefully crafted ways to hurt them as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, the mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk through her latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she said. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind. But that, her, downright, her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she could not earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. Psychologists call this self-sabotage because it's easier to control your circumstance than to be disappointed again. That's what was going on here. He continues on. In retrospect, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to admit that in, in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't do that. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes wide and tear rimmed. Are you part of this family? I asked. She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and wrong, but you're a part of our family and we are not leaving you behind. His daughter's first day at Disneyland finally came and went. And when bedtime rolled around, he writes, I prayed with her, held her and asked, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled with her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. That's what amazing grace is. God, our Father, wants to take us not just to Disney World, but to heaven with him forever. It's not because we're good. It's because we're his. And everything about the Christian life after coming to this realization is about drawing closer and closer to know this amazing God. We don't have to earn our privileges. We receive it by his grace. 
everything that we do now is I want to know you more because you are an amazing God. All of these practices aren't about earning his love. They're about knowing his love more and more and more because we're his. Amen. Some of you this morning feel like, man, there's no way dad could love me. There's no way my father could love me after all that I've done. The question is not how good you are. The question is, are you his? Are you his this morning?